I've always been a very hard worker. I'm a first generation immigrant over to Canada, but even then I never imagined how much further you have to push it in order to be a founder. Eunice, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Tell me about what you're building right now at Acefa. Yeah, with Acefa, essentially a lot of pharmacists are being buried by manual work. So what Acefa does is we have agents that can automate these manual tasks, such as data entry, uh, phone calls, prior authorizations, all this paperwork. And each of these agents can essentially reduce the amount of time by around 50 to 75%. So we give pharmacists back their time so they can focus on the patients instead of these paperwork. Tell me like the pharmacist life before Acefa and then after, like what is the the change you're making? So I actually am a pharmacist. I, I did my doctorate at UBC and it was really fueled by my personal pain points working in a pharmacy where I essentially was doing a lot of data entry. I would have to look at reference material. This is not the stuff that you necessarily need a clinical degree for. Mm -hmm. And probably 90% of my day was being wasted on this manual work instead of actually seeing patients, talking to them, giving them counseling, things that actually require my clinical degree. So where Acefa steps in is we have have these agents that are able to do all this manual work. So instead of having to have pharmacists involved at every single stage, they are just involved at the last step. And at the last step, that's when they are essentially talking to the patient, providing that direct patient care, that direct connection that really needs that, that human involvement. So you were a, a working pharmacist. Tell me how you went from a pharmacist to a software or an AI founder. Yeah, for sure. So essentially, it was during my, my studies and my practice where I became extremely frustrated with the healthcare system. We have an aging population right now. It'll only get worse and worse. And there's just not enough human capital to sustain that gap in the future. And that's really where I, I saw this opportunity where, hey, we need to turn technology. And so I actually founded Acefa with my co-founder, John. And John at the time was working on the microchip that is powering OpenAI and Azure today. And this was right when ChatGPT was getting popular around 2023. And he had very similar experiences as well, where he had many people close to him who struggled to access care in the medical system. So when we met, really, we were united by our passion to, to solve this problem. How'd you guys meet? Because you're very different industries. Yeah, for sure. We, we met in an accelerator program, actually. It's an accelerator based out of Canada. Okay. And we were complete strangers. So we, it's a, a program where they essentially take 36 people, they throw them into a pot. And we started the program as the weakest link. We didn't have a company. We didn't have business experience. Um, we were quite young as well. Um, but near the end of the accelerator, we ended up being one of the top companies and now um, still growing strong today. Gotcha. And how do you and John work together? Because it sounds like as you know, he has the technical chops and then you have the real life, mm. real world problems, pharmacy chops. Like, Tell me how that back and forth goes. Yeah, uh, we learn a lot from each other. Like I, I started learning how to code. I can push things now. And he learned a lot about the, the pharmacy system as well. It's very, very collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's one thing that's really important is when you're looking for a co-founder, it should be complementary skill sets, but not just complementary in terms of the skills where, where you can bounce off each other, but actually making up for each other's weaknesses as well. And that's where we really, really work well together. Cool. Take me to the journey of like, are you, you meet the accelerator, you have this idea, and then how do you go about starting the company? Yeah, we, I think we started the company just based off of seeing a lot of um, issues in the industry. Um, how we started was actually, I sent out a survey to every pharmacist that I ever worked with, all the faculty I used to work with, everyone who's at the hospital, the retail pharmacies, and it was an astounding survey where, where uh, the results showed that, hey, every pharmacist that I personally knew at the time really didn't like their job. Um, we essentially went into the medical system and, and studying pharmacy because we want to help patients. Mm -hmm. that, that's what really drives us, right? But after you're in the program, you realize that there's so much paperwork. And this doesn't just apply to pharmacists, but also nurses, physicians. Um, there's just so much holding you back from practicing to the top of your practice. Was there one thing you wanted to get rid of first and one thing you wanted to automate when you started building? Yeah, we started off with data entry, um, especially because there's, there's so much data transfer between different portals, different softwares. Mm -hmm. um, from there, we expand to a lot of call agents, texting of patients, being able to help with the patient engagement experience as well. Tell me about this agent you built, because mm -hmm. what does it run on? Like, tell me about the code. Like, what is, 
who built it and how, how does it work? Yeah, for sure. We, we build our models internally. Um, so with our models, we have a mix of different types of data that it's trained on. Um, some of it is synthetic, some of them is real world. Well, the way that we've built it is actually um, one of the, the important parts that, that I like to keep in mind as a pharmacist is every pharmacist, every clinician has their own preferences. Mm -hmm. What that means is there's no one size fits all software. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind when you're building something for healthcare. Um, because clinicians are very particular, um, if you have the ability to uh, give pr different configurations, that, that's really something that makes or breaks your software. Um, so we not only had to learn how to train the model to be very, very high accuracy, um, but also learn how to train the model in a way where, hey, it can also adapt to different clinician styles. Yeah, this is, you know, if you're working with pharma pharmaceuticals and, mm -hmm. and pharmacists, this is, these are life and death decisions. Exactly. How, do you, how did you kind of safeguard it, make sure that it was accurate, test it and be for the real world? Yeah, for sure. So in terms of our accuracy, that's actually where a lot of our research goes into, where we are refining our accuracy every day. And today, um, we're around 96, 97%. Even then, if you have, for example, like a 0.5 error rate, if you think about the, the breadth of patients that you're serving, even if you have like 0.5%, that could be hundreds of thousands of patients per year. Um, so that's why we always keep the clinician in place. Mm -hmm. We're not meant to replace the clinician in any way. We essentially have a system where actually a lot of research goes into the user interface as well, where we have the clinician checking at every stage. Gotcha. Then the question becomes, hey, how do we balance the automation with also keeping the human in the loop as well without making more work for them? Gotcha. So it is like a, it's an assistant, it's a sidekick. Correct. It's taking, it's in a lot of the, the faxes and data entry and still the clinicians in charge. Um, you guys have raised, what, $4 million? Correct. Tell me, how did you go about that? Like, what are your tips for fundraising? Yeah, for tips for fundraising, um, I would say I was very new to it. If you asked me two years ago, I didn't know what a VC was. I didn't know what a TAM was. It was a lot of learning online. And our first round, our pre-seed, was actually only $170,000. Okay. So we actually had to stretch that $170,000 over the next three years. But we were very resourceful. Um, in terms of fundraising itself, I, I think it's a, it's a very... Interesting journey. Um, you have to really be good at storytelling, being able to, to talk about and emphasize not only your passions, but essentially where this opportunity to go, um, what is the future that you see and what you can create as well. Very cool. What is the business model? How do you make money? Yep. We charge per usage. Um, so when we are implemented into the various softwares that the clinicians use, um, we make it an important fact that if you're not using the software, we're not going to charge you. So if you, for example, have spikes in, in patient volume, you pay accordingly. If you have a downturn of patient volume, you pay accordingly. And that's something that's really important because what we're trying to solve for is, hey, we don't want you to overhire when there is a surge of, of like necessity for this type of service, and then you have to fire people. That that's, that defeats the whole purpose. Right? I see. Very cool. What you, with this money raised, what do you, what's the plan? What is like the next growth plan for the next year or two for you? Yeah, I, I the vision uh, essentially executing the vision of Asefa, and what the vision that we're trying to work towards is we want to put the entire patient journey into one large language model context window. What that means is right now, if you go see a physician, they have to communicate with a nurse. If you go get a prescription at a pharmacy, they have to fax your physician. And this causes a lot of delays in care and a lot of issues because number one, um, you don't get access to your medications. Lots of patients are waiting up to 40 days to get medications because there's so many approval processes, right? Um, there's a lot of miscommunication and it's also a lot of pressure on the patient to be really good storytellers of like, hey, this is my patient experience. So, where we see this going and what we're building towards is this data fabric where essentially we have all the patient information in one place. So imagine you as a patient, you don't have to, have to worry, ever have to worry if you're seeing a new physician, hey, do they have all the information necessary to make this clinical judgment? If you're going to a different pharmacy, hey, do I have all the information that is needed? Um, and you as a patient have that comfort. Wow. So you're almost building a whole communication system Correct. as well on top of that. Yes. Yes. What does the company look like in terms? Because you're doing, you're dealing with, you know, obviously you're selling into pharmacies, but then you're also doing a ton of research and then engineering. Mm -hmm. like what is the the composition look like? The composition is is very mixed. We try to do. Um, all, everyone on our team is either a clinician or an engineer. We build this company internally with being pharmacists first. And, and being pharmacists first, essentially, that's a really important part because if you're building software for pharmacists, it should be built by pharmacists who really understand the problems that we're experiencing, how we would want the ideal software. And, and that's really how we're, we're communicating with, with our target audience. Cool. You went from you know, a pharmacist to a founder. 
-hmm. What was the, that journey like and what was the biggest surprise? It was very rewarding, I will say. It's very rewarding. I think, um, me personally, um, I have this goal of touching 30 million patient lives within the next year. And that number, 30 million, is very specific. And the reason being is that every pharmacist, um, on average, they see around 30,000 patients per year. Okay. And by building a business, I've had the opportunity to 1,000x my learning, I feel. And this opportunity, now I want to take that and be able to 1,000x the impact I can have on these patient lives as well. What's been the biggest surprise about being a founder? The amount of sacrifices you have to make, um, the amount of hard work. I, I think I've always been a very hard worker. I know, like, I, I'm a first generation immigrant over to Canada, and um, my parents worked very, very hard to put, um, make sure that we were, like, always had food on the table. And from them, I learned a lot of sacrifice, hard work, how to be resourceful. But even then, I never imagined how much further you have to push it in order to be a founder. Wow. What's like, if you were going to give yourself a piece of advice before launching? What would it be about being a founder? I think being a founder requires you to be very open-minded. Um, you have to essentially go against the grain of what you learned in school. And what I mean by that is not necessarily the education and the content that you learned, but actually unlearning the, the principles, being that, hey, when you're in school, um, you essentially have one opportunity to submit uh, an assignment and then get a grade. And I think after being a founder, that's something that I'm a little bit against in the, the, the education system, because really you should have the opportunity, once you get that grade, to then make improvements and get a higher grade. And that's some, the principle that, that I think founders have, where it's like, hey, even if something is not perfect, you should go for it, you should submit it, get that feedback. And that's the fastest way that you can iterate and learn. Wow, that's great. What, um, on top, like on, on talking about that, is there a business philosophy that you prescribe to that's made all the difference? Yeah. One of um, the, the people I really look up to is Ray Dalio. Um, the way that he runs his businesses are a little bit controversial, but one of the principles is um, radical transparency. And that's one of the principles that we uphold within our company as well, where, hey, we need to be direct with each other. We need to give each other feedback whenever possible. Hey, uh, the people that I work with, I, I don't work with them because they're extremely talented. They are. But one of the main reasons is they're extremely good at challenging me. And, and that's something that I, I think is really important. Well, when people talk about AI, healthcare is one of the main targets in terms of there could be a huge revolution, right. whether it's about treatment, whether it's about creating new drugs, again, fixing that crazy communication fax machine system. What are you seeing right now just in the healthcare field in general? And like, what is your big prediction over the next five years of AI and healthcare combined? Yeah. You know, I think healthcare has traditionally been an industry that takes a while to innovate. Um, like, for example, AI scribes actually existed since 2018. Only in 2024 did we see a huge surge of AI scribes being adopted. I think a pat that pattern has started to become broken. Um, right now, we work with quite a few large enterprises where they're actually seeking an AI strategy, seeking a direction on where can we go with this technology. So I think that we're going to see a real shift where there's a lot of potential for new innovation to come in. Great. Eunice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.